New Zealand uh, a lot. And he writes with a little bit of a nuance. And he says, like, he says, I get what Brown is saying. There's some, there's some virtue to it. There's some correction. And I get this notion of being zealous. But I'm going to say there's a bit of a nuance there. And the nuance is between mere zeal, hyper zeal, right? So he writes that merely zealous lawyer is concerned with the legal interests of the client, which kind of rings of, of which model? Bowman. OK. Bowman. Yes, exactly. Like it's got that notion, right? So that's mere zeal. It's merely zealous. Then he says there is the notion of zealously pursuing clients' rights, no obligation to pursue interests beyond the law. Then there's the hyperzealous lawyer. And the hyperzealous, according to Tendere, that hyperzealous lawyer is not concerned just with the legal rights, but to pursue any advantage through the law. So if you read, I'll tell you the page right now. In your textbook, you can go to page 18. 18. So there writes So there's the article, right? So okay, um, I'm gonna do one of those things. Um, uh, volunteer, volunteer reader. Volunteer reader, so we can talk about it in class. So it's Tim Deer's Zeal versus Hyper Zeal. Um, Tangential, you know, on the boundaries, and he says, nope, too far. You've gone too far. Jill. I mean, he would basically say all those types of things you see on television lawyer shows, the Perry Mason, like, all of that would run afoul with him. The, the Every legal television show would run afoul, right? Because uh, we'll talk about them if you want, but how to get away with murder, first of all. Everything is wrong. Like, everything is wrong in that show, right? I don't know who they use as a consultant, but everything they do is from that perspective. That's my opinion. You can disagree. Um, okay, so we have that sort of we have that sort of notion. So what we'll see in this course as we go through it, we'll see this as kind of an undercurrent, like a repetitive undercurrent, like in uh, like in music, right? An undercurrent that repeats itself and we'll see aspects of it of how lawyers conduct themselves, how judges perceive it and some of the decisions that flow from that. So we're still talking about general concepts here. So what is the public interest? So we as lawyers have to work in the public interest, right? So we have to advance the cause of our clients. We have a public interest component. And that includes all that good stuff, justice, fairness, government institutions, and so on. At the same time, like you're juggling, right? At the same time, laws of business, we're not in it for charity. Like maybe you'll do pro bono work. Good for you. Absolutely good for you. But you gotta earn a living, right? You gotta pay for the BMW, and you gotta pay for the cottage in the smoke. So, so you're trying to earn a living, 
it's a business. Uh, there's a monopoly, right? Because not anyone can do this job. Um, profit motivation and so forth. So the notion of professionalism has been you know, written about and studied and discussed. So Alan Hutchinson, another ethical, ethical ethics writer, professor, he talks about what professionalism is, an essential element of which, of uh, the uh, vocation of law, professionalism must be part of the lawyer's everyday work. So you've got to rise to this standard, right? You've got to rise to the standard of being professional in your work. What does that mean? Well, it means a whole bunch of things, and part of a big chunk of that are your ethical obligations of professionalism. And here are some of the elements. All that good stuff. I mean, arguably, human beings should have, like, you know, we all should, but in particular, we as this little subset, this little privileged subset of, um, of society, have things like competence. You better be confident. That's why you buy insurance, just in case. Scholarship, we go through a rigorous education. Not everybody can do that. Integrity, honor, leadership, independence, pride, spirit, enthusiasm, civility, public good, right? Public interest, and commercialism. All good stuff. So let's talk about integrity for a moment. Like, if you don't have integrity in what you're doing, what have you got? You've got nothing. You've got nothing. Integrity is your, like, you've got many, but it's one of your, it's one of your flags. You have to exhibit professional self-discipline, high standards. It transcends a higher standard that's expected of all lawyers, and you must take individual responsibility for your personal ethics but also a collective responsibility that the profession as a whole is represented. And we talked last time about when you do something, behind you stand all of us. So the lawyer who does something that the media gets a hold of and it reflects poorly, not only on that one individual, but on all of us. And that's your responsibility. We're all standing behind you. Not just this class. We're all standing behind you, the profession. Honor, another great, you know, Another 10 cent word, honor. It's related to integrity, it's a similar sentiment, and it talks about dignity. Dignity, honor, um, integrity. Must be seen in a lawyer's everyday actions and attitudes towards peers, new members, clients, judges, those who assist in administration of justice. We're gonna touch on a case today, briefly, not in your materials, um, a decision of uh, the Law Society um, in January of 2019. This case is eight months old, talking about this stuff, right? Which we, we say, or you know, uh, we looked at, germinates back in the 1800s with Lord Brown. So, real world relevance. Civility and collegiality. So, civility and collegiality have been, you know, <laughs> many times the subject of, of, of court cases, law society cases. I mentioned the Joe Breyer case, a big part of that case. And, um, and it talks about, or it, con it con considers such things as being courteous, dignified, civil, professional. And collegiality undergrids, 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 undergrids professional self regulation and mutual and well. So here's the thing. You know, we saw a picture of um, uh, Saul Goodman, right? Yeah. First day, right? So what kind of lawyer do you want to be? When the phone rings and you see a display that says, I need your name tag, that says Sue. It's Sue Long calling from ABC Law Firm. Is your colleague, your, you know, your counsel on the other side, is their first thought, oh my God, this is going to be a nightmare working with this person? Or is their reaction going to be, you know what? We're going to work it out. She's reasonable. I've worked with her before. It's good. So it's your reputation. I mean, a big part of it is your reputation. And sure, you can write papers and articles and have a high profile. But it's how you interact with your colleagues that this, that this notion is focusing. So what are some of the models? What are the traditional model? Moral detachment. The alternative model. We looked at that model, right? Other interests, other clients, opposing lawyers, the court, other sectors of society. Your opposing counsel calls you. 
It's a week before their filing of a document is due. They call you and they say, like, my kid has the flu, I've been sick, I need an extra two weeks. Your client says, no way, man, hold them to every deadline. What do you do? Yeah. You try to talk your client into compromising or being acquiescent because you might be the one next time who has the sick client or the sick lawyer. Okay, who agrees? Who says something different? Uh, you agree with that? Okay, anyone say something different? Um, Mohammed? Yes, uh, I think the lawyer owes a duty to his client. And uh, basically, in the courtroom scenarios, most of the time, lawyers uh, imply such type of tactics in order to delay the trial. So I think that uh, it's uh, no doubt that we all are colleagues, uh, and uh, we have a relationship with each other. Uh, but uh, still, uh, we owe duty to our clients. Okay, hands up, who's that? I agree with both. Is there exactly? Is there a third perspective, Jude? Yeah, I agree with both because on the one hand, yes, um, you are supposed to be there to represent your client with all your beings. However, as she said, the next time it could be you. So I would try to talk to my client in the meantime and explain to them what, how the situation works. And if, okay, they are adamant and they say no, then I have to go with what my client says in the end. It all depends on is it the first time that lawyers called you with this somebody got the flu or is it the tenth time? Right. <laughs> right. I mean, has their mother died more than once? Yeah. Right. That's my excuse. Um, right. So it's contextual. So the answer is the answer is it all depends. It all depends. Depend. Depends on the context. Depends how many times. Depends on if the phone rings and you have to tell this lawyer and you say, Oh my God, this is going to be a nightmare because this guy asks for adjournments constantly. That might influence your decision. Your client might influence your decision because your client might say, yeah, but if you give him two weeks, I'm going to lose the house. Right? So you've got to take every aspect into that, put it all to your student, and figure it out. But recognize that it's an ethical problem. And maybe what you say, here's another option, maybe what you say is, dude, I get it. Your kid is sick, been there, I get you. My client is freaking out because of such and such without disclosing any confidential information. But my client is saying, it's not. That's not a confidential thing. Let's go and argue it in front of the judge and ask for an adjournment, see what the judge has put it in the third part of the case, right? But before you do that, because there's a cost involved to that attendance, right? See what you can work out. It depends on all of the, all of the context. Okay. Um, okay. So, so that's that notion of the other lawyer. So back to regulation. Back to regulation by the law society. So the law society regulates your conduct. It's provincial, right? Uh, the provincial rules will be shockingly similar to the model code, which is our <coughs> document that's passed. And what you have is the model code, and here are the chapters. There are seven chapters, um, but more than just the chapters which say stuff like, thou shalt be honorable, or whatever, or thou shalt be competent. There are a bunch of commentaries, so you don't have to pull it up now, but if you look at, well, if you look at your, uh, whether you print it or not, there are a bunch of commentaries, and you're responsible for the commentaries. So you might have a rule, I just opened one up, 3.4-9, look, um, if a client consents to a joint retainer, there's the rule, there's a bunch of commentary, and the commentaries, you're responsible for the commentaries, put me on the ball. The commentaries give you a perspective, the commentaries give you um, uh, a little bit of depth and analysis and sometimes, sometimes case law, which will influence the evolution of the rules, will be cited in there. So you can have that with you, right? So read the commentaries because there's good stuff in the commentaries, for sure. So these are the chapters. Interpretation definitions is kind of a statutory approach, right? The first thing you do. Then chapter two, the whole chapter is about integrity. And the whole chapter is this long. Here's chapter two. Here's chapter two. Someone read it. Come on, quick. Someone read it. Opportunity for voluntary participation that I'm asking you to do. It's not that long. Someone? Yeah. Um, I need your name here. G. I think you're in Okay, so chapter two is 
needs for integrity. Yes. A lawyer has a duty to carry on the practice of the law and to discharge all responsibilities to clients, tribunals, the public, and other members of the profession honorably and with integrity. There you go. You can memorize the entire chapter. It's right there. The whole thing is about integrity. And what the Law Society or the Federation of Law Societies has done is they've said, we're going to highlight this. We're going to isolate this. It's going to be buried somewhere else. No. Um, no, it's here. But in addition to that, right, there's a bunch of commentaries. And the commentaries, all kinds of good stuff. I mean, we don't have to read them. You should read them. See, I've highlighted them. I put a few notes. You can do that. Um, so integrity, big one. Uh, chapter four is marketing. Marketing is marketing, right? Um, chapter six is students and employees because you will work in an environment with others. Be nice to your students. They'll be lawyers one day. Nope. Yeah. Okay, chapter three. Chapter three, in contrast to chapter two, the biggest chapter. All kinds of good stuff. It's all good stuff. All the chapters have good stuff. You get everything. But here's what chapter three includes. Chapter three is kind of the um, roll up your sleeves and start working. But chapter three includes competence. Surprise, spoiler alert. You have to be competent in the area in which you practice. And you have an obligation to not take on work for which you are not competent. Makes sense, right? Competence, quality of service, honesty, candor, encouraging settlement, very important. You can't use inducements. Confidentiality. We talked about that last day. Very important. Conflicts of interest. Huge area of concern. Preservation of property fees, contingency <coughs> withdrawal. Lots of withdrawal options, right? Non payment, criminal, obligatory, and so forth. So three good stuff in three. Three is three is a big chapter. I'm like two. Three is a big chapter. Three is a big Big fashion. Um, and commentaries, commentaries, commentaries. Let's look at one. Let's look at 3.2-7. I need a reader. I need a reader. I need a reader. We got we gotta keep rolling here. Okay, uh yeah. Just read the room. Uh please. Stand up please, nice and um, I'm sorry, I can't hear you, so um, maybe others can. 3.2-7, can you just, just a bit louder would be great. Okay. A lawyer should be on guard against becoming the goal or the guilt of an unconscious penalty from the kind of all of others, whether or not associated with um, the <coughs> Um, okay, so 3.2-1 commentary one. Okay, so for, thank you. So what does that tell you? Yankun, what does that tell you? Like, what is the, that commentary one? Uh, so it tells me a lawyer should uh, have their own thought. So, and uh, so she can't just listen to what the, their clients say. Right. So, uh, the lawyer should have um, his own mind and uh, to um, and, and thought. Oh. Right, and they should. To the point where you must be on guard against being a tool or a dupe. Being a tool or a dupe, being used, being used by your client to facilitate or accomplish something that either is a little dodgy, not so sure, contrary to your own moral you know, ethics or understanding of the law, where you are being used. You are being used as a vehicle, a tool or a dupe. So the, 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 the commentary, you see the rule just says, be competent, but, or whatever it says, but it's the commentary. And so this notion is picked up in this article, don't be a tool, don't be a tool. Um, in a uh, 2011 article in the magazine, serious concerns that some lawyers may have become tools or dupes of their clients, disciplining two Tories lawyers. Tories is a big fat giant law firm, right? Who um, were in conflict of interest, involved with 
payments that Conrad Black and his Hollinger company were making. And, and the article says that without integrity, a lawyer is useless to their client, right? Integrity, if you haven't got that, you've got nothing. Um, it's critical we understand our duties as lawyers, duty of integrity, conflict of interest, a long-standing client who pays handsomely but needs assisting in protecting his interests by bending some rules or sugarcoating certain information from public authorities can be difficult to stand up against. This is Conrad Black, right? Ex-con. Yeah. Um, and these lawyers, uh, McCarthy's, so so the lawyers are, uh, so they have a law society action against them, right, for sugarcoating or helping Conrad Black use some stuff that's a little dodgy, arguably being used as tools or dupes by their client. Um, so they have this long litigation. Their names are public. There they are, right? Violated professional conflict of interest rules, Beth and Darren. Um, and the allegations have hung over the lawyers in their careers since 2006. So they act on behalf of their client. Subsequently, they're deemed to be tools, dupes, used, you know, manipulated by their clients. Now they've been in litigation, and now it's under appeal, and the appeal will continue to handicap me professionally for most of 2014, which is crushing, says so-and-so, who has retired, but still is in this litigation. So the personal cost, she says, the personal cost, um, is immense. So, I mean, there are serious consequences to failing to live up to your ethical obligations, including not being used by your client to accomplish things or to sugarcoat or to package things a certain way. So that's just a real world example. There you go. Okay, chapter five of the model code talks about advocacy, your duty as an advocate. Not every, who here will be a litigator? Seriously? Okay, corporate, in-house. Um, Solicitors work. The rest of you, you're gonna <laughs> be artists, painters, <laughs> very educated people. Okay. Um, so this has to do with witnesses. Not everyone like this Okay. Chapter seven: a, a relationship with society, other lawyers, public office, public appearances. Okay. Law society complaints process. FYI, heaven forbid, if you see on your phone four one six nine four seven thirty three hundred. Draw your mouse, pick it up, answer the call. That's the law society in Ontario. Uh, complaints process, a client complains about you, it's like your worst nightmare, but they call, you jump. You do whatever you want, you interview, you give documents, you cooperate. Okay. Law society's mandate to regulate. That's their job. They have statutory authority, jurisdiction, you have to respond to complaints. Their mandate is to investigate and prosecute where appropriate claim complaints, right? Or compliance, yeah. So your client's not happy with you? There's one school of thought that says you're not a real lawyer until somebody complains about you. <laughs> it was dismissed, okay? It was shut down before it got any further. But and someone complained, so I mean, like it happens, right? Um, okay, so there's an intake process, a vetting process, Complaints resolution, they try to resolve the problem. Sometimes it's streamed on to investigations where they call you, they do an interview, hand me your documents, give me your file, and you say yes. You say yes, absolutely. What time works for you and you're going to um, Serious breaches include capacity issues. Now, capacity is different than competence, right? Capacity has to, you know, capacity has to do with physical, psychological, mental, whatever capacity to, to carry out the practice. Good character, very important. Unauthorized practice, okay. There's a, a, a committee that reviews and authorizes whether a matter goes forward, it becomes public, it goes on the public website to the law society. You can Google your name, it shows up, the first link, and you go, oh my God, my mother's gonna see this. Um, public, okay. Tribunal here, is that a tribunal? What's a tribunal? What's a tribunal? <coughs> okay. Um, they can adjudicate, and it's a uh, decision maker. Uh, often, there um, things are uh, 
in the day by statutory regimes that the landlord can come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So tribunal try, right? So it's usually a three person panel. There's usually a legally trained person here. There will be, but in law side, they have a public member. There's someone who's not. Um, and in some boards, there's a legal person and two um, experts, right? It's a delegation from the court system because you have expertise in whatever it is, in this case, a court. Um, three ventures sit on the hearing. Okay. Um, they make a decision, range of penalties that you can, you can, that can be sustained. Um, fine. Loss of license. We just spent $300,000 on getting this far in your career, you take the yank your license. You gotta go back to accounting school or something else, right? Um, so that's the most serious. That's the capital punishment. That's the capital uh, punishment. You can have restrictions and warnings. Uh, appeal process is available. Um, okay, this is one of those, you know, this is one of those uh, FYI stories. You can read about it, but it's about a fellow called, what's his name? Ronald Davidovich. Um, and he had his license taken. He went to federal penitentiary as a sex offender, um, but he was reinstated. He's satisfied with the hearing panel that he was um, of good character and could be reinstated. So it's not always permanent. Generally, it is. Who has heard of Diamond and Diamond? <laughs> so the reason I read a couple of decisions. So this is F, this is FYI. Okay, if you want to read about it, there's a real world example in 2017. Um, what else does the enforcement department do? Monitoring and enforcement, the orders that are made. Summary hearings are summary hearings are um, expeditious because they're straightforward or they're very serious. So failing to respond to the law society, failing to cooperate with the law society, failing to maintain your financial records every year, you have to file your annual trust accounting, hire an account like let a numbers person do it. There's a reason your law and not, right? not an actuarial thing. Um, practicing will under suspension. Okay, volunteer. Who was my last volunteer? My last volunteer was, yeah, who? Excellent. Anyone? Volunteer, volunteer, okay. Uh, I need your name tag, because that's how I remember who's talking in class. There you go, Petra. So just read the um, highlighted section. Oh, and the date. Stand up nice and loud. <coughs> All practitioners have an obligation to cooperate with their regulator. At what point does a delay in providing information to the regulator demonstrate a lack of good faith cooperation? Go on, just read the um the highlights. Okay. The highlight section. Okay, um, this decision reinforces that a practitioner's duty to cooperate with their regulator means a prompt and complete response. Okay, and read the title and the date. Um, the cooperation we want regulator must be prompt. The date is um, sorry, 2019. 2019. Okay, yeah, then it's Diamond and Diamond, right? Yeah. So, so uh, his name is, uh, what's his first name? Jeff, Jeff, Jeremy, Jeremy? So this is a, an example of a 2019 decision. Um, you can read it if you want. Extra reading. Who likes extra reading? <laughs> so if you don't, you don't have to. Uh, so it's a um, decision regarding Jeremy Guy. And so the, the, the decision speaks to the standard. The standard is it, the decision reinforces a practitioner's duty to cooperate with the regular means a prompt and complete response to their presence. Petra, what does that say to you? What is what? So, what does this decision mean for us? To you, for us as lawyers, when the law society says um, your obligation is to act in good faith, um, law society v. Diamond says there's an objective standard, and you have to be prompt and complete in your response. What does that say? To you? Generally means um, um, acting in the, 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 the
Anyone want to help out? Huh? Mm -hmm. After you get faith, yeah. Um, Jim Rimmel? Yeah. Um, so, not, I guess, sort of, not really a defrauding the other side, but almost like not acting in a way that puts the other side at a significant disadvantage to a point where they can no longer fight their case or, or they don't have access to certain uh, resources that they may otherwise have access to if you had, let's say, corresponded at an uh, earlier date. Okay, yes. Yes, now take that into the context that Petra was talking about where the, the court says the objective standard is when a lawyer is being asked to cooperate with the law society, they have to act in good faith. How does that translate into this into this 2019 decision in the real world? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sir. Uh, I guess uh, the rationale is that when you respond, you respond should be not see a way to defeat the purpose that the society is asking for the information. Okay, and I'll start our hand. So basically, um, I think that in this context is made for the society to demand certain documents with respect to this case, provided promptly, I don't try to buy documents, yeah. within documents, you know, in the high stakes, like that. Yeah. So it's that good faith concept yeah. notion, and we put it into this context, which is the law society, which is your regulator. So remember, you can be prosecuted for failing to, sorry, did you have a comment as well? Yes, I was just saying the same thing that okay. he says, that yeah. you need to be thorough and provide. And prompt, right, and thorough and prompt, right, because that's what this decision says. And again, this is not on your exam, this case is not in your textbook, but it picks up on this notion, failure to respond and failure to cooperate, right? So you can be prosecuted by the law society for failing to respond when the phone rings, you see that number, you pick it up, um, uh, or failing to cooperate, even if the underlying thing, they're calling you because your client complained uh, about you didn't show up in court one day or something, and it's completely wrong. So the underlying thing, you say, well, that's just nonsense. The client had the wrong date. I was there on time. Even if the substantive matter of the complaint is completely without merit, you fail to cooperate or fail to respond, they can still process. So, so it can be it can be to your detriment even though you're on side substantive. And that's in part in this decision in part the cooperation was tardy. It took several months or something. It didn't have that notion of promptness and completeness and thoroughness. Okay. Okay. Um, anyone else? Uh, complaints Resolution Commission, okay, so that can happen with the Law Society. Uh, the complainant can review a request if it's shut down without merit. Legal liability. Um, the standards, this is an important concept, is the standard. The standard is not one of perfection, but it must exercise so your, your liability. So if there's a complaint to the Law Society, the question is, did you act contrary? Because you always cooperate, no one's going to have that charge, right? Uh, did you did you um, discharge your professional obligations to the standard expected? And the standard is not perfection because who among us is perfect? Don't raise your hand because I'm not going to believe. Um, but you must exercise the care, skill, diligence commonly observed by other lawyers in like circumstances. So if you are a three-year call and you are a twenty-year call it's going to be to your level. And you're an expert in real estate, you're an expert in family law, that's the standard to which you'll be held. Commonly held, other lawyers in like circumstances. And you must have liability insurance. That's a mandatory thing. Uh, malpractice claims. The number one malpractice claim by clients is fail to follow client instructions, fail to obtain, uh, obtain consent or inform the client, poor communication. Then things like deadlines, limitation periods. <laughs> I like this one. Not knowing the law. Confidence, right? Maybe you should know the law before you do your practice in a particular area. Fraud, okay. Ah, we, we finished yesterday's, or last day's class. Remember to sign in. Okay, we are going to move on to today's class. Hooray. Eh, not bad. Today's class is, who's this? Oh, that's Gregory Peck. It um, is Gregory Peck. Who's the lawyer? Work. 
Atticus Finch. Atticus Finch. What kind of lawyer is Atticus Finch? The best. <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of lawyer is Atticus Finch? Okay, who's seen the movie? Who's read the book? It was a while ago. I know. <laughs> what kind of lawyer is he? It is a criminal case. What kind of, what kind of ethics is he bring? Uh, I need your name tag. I need your name tag. Right Actually, don't huh? have one. Lucky for you. What's your name? Uh, Ikra. Ikra. What is what kind of ethic? Like what kind of ethical stand does Atticus Fish? Um, he's very. He's one with integrity. He always did the right thing, the moral thing. Not just like whatever was legally right, but he also cared about what was happening to the other party as well. And it's a it's an excellent book. You haven't read it. You know. Go ahead. He's a real advocate. Yeah, and that's I think it's criminal law, right? Yeah. Okay. So today's lecture, lecture two, hooray, here's my disclaimer, everyday disclaimer, right? Because I'm not wearing my lawyer hat, no legal advice. I'm not telling you anything, legal, no legal advice here, you can't. Okay, today we're going to continue talking about uh, governance, good character, and law society. Okay. Oh, we forgot a joke. Today's joke. Today's last day's joke went live, like that thing crashed. So a better joke for today. Better joke, legal joke, lawyer joke. Uh, a lawyer dies. Um, lawyer dies, and at the burial, ground is open, there's a big hole in the ground, and his three friends are standing here going, oh man, another one gone. And the three friends are a dentist, an accountant, and a lawyer. The dentist says, he was such a good guy, he lent me money to finish dental school. So I gave his widow a bunch of money. The accountant says, you know what? I agree, he was such a good guy, he helped me open my practice. So I donated a bunch of money in his name to a chair. And the lawyer says, you know what, he was a good guy. He helped me fund my first rental lease for life. So to repay him, I wrote a check for his book. That one you get, right? Okay. So now we're talking about governance as a legal profession. That's us. That's us. And we have a number of ways in which we are accountable, right? Civil rules, court negligence, court rule, legislation, market forces. We are governed by our, our, our uh, um, profit aspect, business aspect, and the law society. So we have all kinds of things coming at us to, um, that we have to be responsible for. Self-regulation, talked about SROs, right? Self-regulator, that's us. What are the main responsibilities of the law society? Admissions, right? You all have to satisfy the admissions requirements, professional standards, rules of professional conduct. Imagine that. Uh, professional liability insurance, mandatory if you have to have it. Um, CPD, continued professional education, and complaints, investigations, hearing, and professional discipline. Heaven forbid you're hauled in front of the the, uh, the Law Society Tribunal and in Ontario, paralegals as well. Let's look at something. Go to page 209 of your textbook. And I need another vol volunteer. I want to hear your voice. So 209, 209. What's there? Probably something good. Okay, 209. I need your name tag, everybody. Delphina. Oh, man. Uh, there's no way I'm reading that. Okay, <laughs> Delphina. Go to page 209 and read the um, last two lines on the page and over to the other side. Thanks a lot. Yeah. The basic model adopted, for example, in Ontario, Northwest Territories, and British Columbia is that lawyers are obliged to participate in 12 hours of CPD per year two of which must focus on either practice management or professionalism and legal ethics, three in Ontario. Okay. There are variations in New Brunswick. Should I continue? Um, I don't think so because you've all told me you're mostly Ontario lawyers, right? Excellent. Thank you. And write your name. Just your first name. Okay. Big. Okay. So, 12 hours. It doesn't sound like a lot. It's really not. There's no excuse. But what happens is every year, like this time of year, come November, there's this flood 
of people trying to scurry to finish their hours in the last day. You're reading, you're reading about real estate ethics and you practice it down the long as you start getting the hours, right? So one strategy that I use is to get them all in front. January, February, March, I'm done, right? Everything else is free. But, so you've got 12, three of which are professionalism ethics, which is this stuff, this stuff. So whatever area you practice in, there's going to be an ethics component to it, and your whatever you join or whatever will send you um, emails with uh, CPD presentations, an hour and a half here, two hours there, whatever, and then you have to log them with the law society, and if you don't log enough, they send you a nasty email saying, you haven't got enough hours. Um, okay, so that's Ontario, 12 and 3, and you got to do it, you got to do it. And not only that, like, I mean, much of your day any given day will be legal reading, keeping up with your area, right? You gotta keep up with your competence levels, right? Okay, so we've got that. Yeah, 12, three professionalism, nine substantive. In addition, you've got something new. So we've got a new component that is due. The deadline is 2020. But the new component is effective January of last year, you also have to do an EDI requirement. Quality, diversity, inclusion, three hours focusing on those, and you have to finish them before December 2020. Okay? So that's an additional, this is like new, right? So so the, the basic standard is 12, three ethics, and then the three additional ones, but you have a period of time because there's a, uh, there's a transition period. So this is a requirement. Uh, what is the requirement? Uh, you have to have a total of three accredited professionalism hours to focus on advancing quality, diversity, inclusion. Um, the purpose is training on equality, diversion, inclusion to create awareness of the challenges faced by racialized licensing, the system enhancing diversity, inclusion in all workplaces. Um, G. G. I was reading recently that lawyers were taking issue with the EDI requirement. With the EDI requirement? Yes. Okay. What was the issue? It seems like they felt that they were being forced to comply. Okay, are we talking about EDI or state Oh. Let's look at this. Interesting segment. Oh. Is that There you go. Okay, and so what's your understanding of the issue? So EDI, I haven't, if someone's heard, let me know. I haven't heard any particular debate on that issue. EDI? Um, so, statement of principles. What do you understand about that, Jean? Pardon what do you understand is the issue part? They need to express how they felt about. Yeah. I think they had to express. Is it expressing how they felt about the EDI? So I think there was a statement of expression that they need to to make, and they felt as if they were being forced. So let's make a distinction between EDI and SOF, right? Statement of principles. So hang on. So Jean, anything else you want to add? Then one, no, and then it crap. Yeah, hold up. What? You want to listen? Yes. As far as I'm aware, there has not been a raging debate about EDI, equality, diversion, inclusion. And that simply is a requirement that you take educational courses to enlighten you on those ethical issues before the end of 2020 and then after the end of 2020. Every year, in addition to 12, of which three are ethics, you'll have an additional requirement of three for EDI. So that's a CPD requirement, continued professional development. That's for your elucidation. Okay, now, unless someone's heard about a debate on that, I think where the debate lies is, is SOP. Statement of principles, which is a different concept, right? So, statement of principles is what is what is what is SOP? What is SOP? Okay, what is SOP? Um, I was actually going to make a comment on the EDI. EDI, okay, go ahead. Um, a few years previously, there was um, a, a lot of talk in the press about. Do you remember there was a lawyer named Selwyn Peters? I do. And like, it, was that the sort of thing that prompted the um, requirement coming in 2018? Was that that sort of issue? You know, like, I don't know with a certainty, but I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, the Law Society is trying to be responsive and current and, and engaged, and if they hear a number of issues from the community, kind of try to respond to that might well have been part of it. 
Okay. Let's talk about SOC because SOC has been. I, I was going to go to that too. Okay, okay. so just hold on. Hold your thought. So SOC is, unlike the EDI, which is that shall take a course, passive, right? You're just taking information. The SOC is actually a requirement that you create or write or sign on to a pledge or a notion or a, or a promise of how you will behave in your practice. So this is more, this is more, um, um, it com compels you to do something as opposed to sit back and receive. So that's, I think, the main distinction or how we can think about it. So Juan, what do you want to say? Uh, last week, I think that... Uh, so louder, so... I'm oh, sorry. Uh, last week, I think that uh, the um, Law Society uh, um, decided that uh, lawyers and paralegals are no longer obliged to adopt in their statement of principles uh, the obligation to promote equality, diversity, and inclusion. So that's where it crosses over. So promoting it versus learning about it, right? Mm -hmm. Passive, active. Um, correct. Thank you. Ikra? Yeah, I was just going to say that the issue was similar to the issue that came up with Jordan Peterson about freedom of speech, that you can't force anyone to say that yeah. they feel a certain way or, mm -hmm. you know, like yeah. you can't yeah. like, enforce something like that. Also. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, not on your exam, but if you want to read it. So it says, stop the SOC, right? So there was a raging, was there anybody else that had a comment on SOC? Uh, the raging debate as to until now where you have the option to this point it was mandatory you had to sign off on this thing right raging debate by many lawyers and in fact there was a, a promoter or a program that says st stop the off um where there was a contingent of lawyers when they run for venture seats they have to like it's like an election right? and we all vote uh some were the stop the soft contingent so if you voted for enough of them they get on the ventures they can vote this thing out but huge debate arguments on both sides Happy to talk about it offline, um, but for your purposes, it's now optional, right? That's the latest. Long saga. And it says something about, I stand by the following principles. You have to kind of actively buy into it. And many lawyers were, were um, objected to it. So it became oh, just a huge issue. Huge, real world, real world stuff. Okay. Um, okay, so. Look, lawyers, right? They're the worst. They can argue both sides. Someone's going to object to something. So you have a bunch of arguments, pro and contra the EDI. Not on your exam, FYI, go ahead, knock yourself. I mean, it's interesting, but we can't cover everything. Okay, <coughs> what's Trinity Western? Oh my god. <laughs> what's Trinity Western? Oh, oh. Trinity Western. Anyone? Chandy, yes. yeah, go ahead. Maybe this case pertains to a college uh, which had some admission uh, restrictions among people from the. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Community, uh, oh, yeah. Community. Yeah, okay, let's turn up. Go ahead. And I guess uh, the law society did, uh, they did not give it affiliation. Right. More than one law society, right? Mm -hmm. okay. More than one province. Mm -hmm. Okay, turn up page 778. 
committee noted concerns with training Westerns ability to teach ethics and constitutional law in light of the fact that its covenant effectively bans LGBT students. He concluded that, however, that Trinity Western had given sufficient assurances to, start to satisfy the committee that it will ensure that students understand the full scope of human rights and constitutional protections in public and private affairs of financial lines. Okay, so in order for a law school to be opened in, at Trinity Western University in British Columbia to, in order to go to law school there, you had to sign a covenant, and the covenant said, I promise, I think the word is in there somewhere, I promise and I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. Right? So that excludes LGBTQ, transgender, all that kind of people. So, so there's a raging debate as to whether or not, and remember, a law school, in order for a law school to be um, given uh, approval, it has to um, apply in each province separately, right? Because each province is a self-regulator. Regulator. And so Ontario, so BC says yes, Ontario, who says no? Ontario says no. Ontario says yes. Pardon? Ontario says no. I can't hear you. Ontario says no. Ontario says no. Um, BC, Nova Scotia. Okay. And so what happens is um, the uh, the thing goes to court, right? Because Western, Trinity Western says, no, 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 we've given you all kinds of insurances. Assurances, assurances. And so what happens is the accreditation, um, at first level, the Law Society of Upper Canada, which is now called Law Society of Ontario, right? So same entity. Um, entitled to consider broad spectrum public interest considerations making its decision, including the covenant which required students to sign was, was discriminatory to LGBTQ. So when the Ontario Provincial, uh, when the Ontario Law Society says we are not going to accredit so you can get a degree there if bc allows it but you can't practice in ontario because we don't recognize the school because we say it's 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 discriminatory right so you've got limitations in your mobility right um when they say the court says on on appeal the law society by its mandate is entitled to consider a broad spectrum of public interest considerations what bell rings What's what's ringing in the back of your head? What's ringing? What do those? What is that concept? We're going to consider a broad spectrum of public interest considerations. Dingling, Simon. The alternative model. Imagine that. Here we are, and we're applying that concept, right? that notion. We're not applying that limited. Now it's not a client, okay? But you see the the echo, right, of that concept, and this is what the court is saying about the law society's decision. So there's that, there's that undercurrent, right? It's coming up in. And so what happens is, uh, 2016, unanimous decision. They upheld the Law Society's decision to deny accreditation. So the court saying, you're on, you're bang on, Law Society of Ontario, or Canada, you're good. And the court says the decision was reasonable because they balanced charter values, right, with the freedom of religion notion, balancing all these different aspects. <coughs> but the court concludes that the covenant is deeply discriminatory. Bad, 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 bad. Um, Supreme Court of Canada 2018, 7-2 <coughs> ruling, 30 interveners. What's an intervener? Okay. So there are third parties who are concerned about the case? They're not the litigants, but they have an interest. They get permission to make submissions, right? Exactly. So 30 interveners, like, that's a lot. Do I have one? Okay. 30 bodies that are not the parties involved that say, I want to speak to this Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says, yes, they get standing. Um, and what they say is, 7-2 uh, ruling, six years after the Christian University proposes a law school, seven judges upheld the Law Society's denial of accreditation. Supreme Court of Canada, our ultimate you know, body, says, Law Societies, you're good. You said thumbs down, too bad for Trinity Western. And what they say is, <laughs> because the covenant is discriminatory, and the covenant would prohibit the conduct throughout three years of law school, 
even when students are off campus in the privacy of their own homes. How do they know? Like, how do they know? What the heck you're doing when you close the door, right? Because what the covenant says, it's only a man in the world. So, the, the Supreme Court says, no, too bad for you, Trinity Western. Those are the, the judges, uh, this is their decision, and we'll be not So just give me a few more minutes, we'll try and plow through some more of this. So that's a case study, that's Trinity Western. That is in your textbook, that is on the exam, and you can read the case and it's full in all of its glory. Okay, so we're talking about um, the structure of the law society, admissions profession, you have to have certain education, you have to have certain courses, you take an oath. And look at the oath. Has anyone done this yet? Not yet, right? You have to stand up in front of your husband, your wife, your mother, your children, whatever, and you have to swear that you accept. And look at the language. We're lawyers. Language matters. Somebody wrote this, language matters. We, you will say, I said it one day, you will say it one day, I accept honor, privilege, duty, responsibility, protect and defend faithful to the best of my ability, not refuse, promote, I will not promote frivolous, don't be a tool or a dupe, remember that? Don't be a tool or a dupe. Um, I will act with honesty, integrity, improve access to justice, I'll obey the rule of law, I will have ethical standards. You're going to swear to this. Okay, and, oh, not only all of that, we have a good character requirement. What the heck? is a good character requirement. What is a good character requirement? That shall be a good character requirement. Uh, Ephraim. Someone with high ethical standards. Okay, and what's that mean? Who's you see, it's kind of a circular yeah, it's thing, ambiguous. right? It's, it's very ambiguous, and it's intentionally ambiguous, right? Because yeah. it's meant to cover a whole range of things you can't, like, list five. like. It's, it's, it's intentionally written that way. Uh, it, it has notions of maintaining public confidence in legal profession. You stand here, but we're all standing behind you. Integrity. Integrity, exactly. Um, dealing fairly, being confident. What is good character? It's a combination of qualities or features that distinguish one person from another. Ugh, what the heck does that mean, right? But it's intentionally so, because you can't, like you can't surgically drill into it. It has ethical. Um, integrity, candor, empathy, honesty, all that good stuff. Remember that long list of things that we're responsible for? It's all kind of folded in here, baked into them. And so we have a case, for example, of uh, Freyra, who, he's a student. He's a student. He hasn't even started his professional career yet, and he's already in trouble with the Lost Society. And he can't get an article job. Hey, I hear you, right? Like that alone is huge big problem and issue and it has been by the way for 20 years you're like this is not new it's always been a problem so um, couldn't get an Arlington job so he enhanced his academic record okay so right we're lawyers ethical integrity honor honesty and he enhances his record he's found out he continues to say no 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 I got straight A's I'll tell you where you can find this case It is a page, interesting enough, 755, so you can go and read it in more detail. So this case, the decision is, should he be, um, should he be accepted into the uh, law society? No, no. You know why? Because being a lawyer is a privilege. You don't, it's not a right. You don't get just to walk and say, here's my money. I've done the law school, take me in. No, it's a privilege. Good character comes from good behavior. What does that mean? It's subjective, it's to be assessed. And in this case, not enough time had passed to consider a change in his character from, oh yeah, enhancing his records, which is, you know, fraud. Uh, Burgess, okay. It's 9.35, we cleaned up from last day, we kind of have a lot today. Five minutes, five minutes. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Um, so, and when considering whether or not to let the person back in, the tribunal will consider factors. 
nature duration. Who was Connor? Was it two weeks? Was it two years? So a lot of contextual issues. Behavior since then. Any remorse. These are all kinds of mitigating factors. It might be aggregating factors. Aggregating factors. Um, any rehabilitative efforts and the amount of time that has passed by. So in this case, enough had passed by. The tribunal says there's no. It's not math. It's not a science. It's an art. We are going to consider there's no mathematical formula, and we have to have a no magic number. We have to have a general approach of whether or not good character has been satisfied. Uh, so stood stats from 2012 to 16, what, four years, Law Society granted applications of only two former lawyers for relicensing on the basis of good character. So it doesn't happen a lot. Okay, real world example. Reader, reader, reader. Reader and yank. Okay, so just read the highlighted section, the title and the date and the highlighted section. So Law Society Tribunal hearing in January 15, 2019. The lawyer was found to have failed to assume responsibility for his practice by failing to adequately supervise his article students and engaged in improper marketing in the management of the website and Twitter account for his practice. His article students' social media communications raised serious concerns about her awareness of her ethical obligations concerning civility, integrity, and confidentiality. Many of them also demonstrated contempt and willing towards participants in the, ju in the justice system, which eroded public confidence in the profession and in the administration. Okay, what does that tell you? What does this case from 2019 tell you about this lawyer? Uh, well, to me, the law, the lawyer was, To me, what I got from yeah, the yeah. law society, pretty much they were um, inspecting or supervising the social media accounts of this lawyer, and the lawyer was also um, watching the art, the article students' um, accounts. Yeah, so yeah, and, and failed to properly um, supervise her. Yeah. yeah, so he's prosecuted by the law society uh, and found liable. Or not? Who has a Twitter account, by the way? And who has social media? I don't know what else is there. Facebook and uh, Instagram, whatever. And do you do you comment about legal issues? No. Okay. But a lot of people do. A lot of people do, and this is a problem for this lawyer who had an article student. And what does the article student do that the lawyer is? Um, so she has her own case. Right? So that's the case of the lawyer who's the supervising lawyer. This is the artist who's which is her own case, right? So let's have another reader and see what happens with her. Another reader, reader, reader. Thank you, um, Annie. Chandy. So you're just going to read um, over six months here. Yes. A uh, nice one. Over, over six month period, the society received four complaints about the applicant's conduct while she was an article student. They included being arrested for an altercation with courthouse staff, offensive Twitter posts about participants in the justice system, some of which potentially breached confidentiality requirements, and set up a searchable public database of police officers, found prosecutors, and justice, the justice is responsible for eroding civil liberties in Canada. The applicant's communication and actions towards a number, a number of persons who were inappropriate, disrespectful, and unprofessional. The applicants on honesty and integrity were not in doubt. Rather, rather the concern was her exercise of judgment and her lack of insight into the impact of her comments on other people. After a one-year break, she completed her articles without further interpersonal conflicts, though she continued to use social media. The applicant recognized her need for assistance, so she retained an executive coach and subsequently a, a psychotherapist. The ongoing therapy assisted, assisted her in dealing with stress, developing strategies to redirect or resolve her anger and frustration in more productive ways. 
and we are open to requesting and avoid support from others. The applicant was, pre was presently of good character and was eligible to be granted a L1 license. Okay, so she is found to be of good character. So what you have is a 2019 decision that talks about the kind of stuff we're talking in class today. It's a real world thing and good character in this particular case was in her favor at the end, but you can see what the kinds of issues that were of concern. Twitter postings, naming bad crowns, naming bad police officers and so forth. So there's a whole there's a whole series of CPDs on social media, how to manage your social media, because many lawyers do use their social media to comment on case law, to promote how smart they are and how they can interpret cases and to solicit clients and that sort of thing. So that's a real world example, not in your example. Um, Federation Law Societies of Canada, they are the national body. They wrote the model code, 2017 is the last iteration. They update it from time to time. And they establish protocols, they have educational standards, that's their job. Um, background of the code, self-regulation. Lawyers, right, they can argue both sides. Maybe that's a good thing, but there are some lawyers that think that self-regulation is good, so there are arguments favor, there are arguments about independence, there are arguments about um, uh, the loss, you know, whether it, it whether regulation is a good thing or not a good thing, the law society, the Federation of Law Societies was in uh, uh, litigation over regulations that would have forced lawyers to collect information about their clients and financial transactions, so when your client comes to you with a suitcase full of money and says, here you go, put it in your trust fund, start acting for me, you're supposed to ask some questions, right? Um, the Supreme Court found those requirements violated the charter. So what the, law, the Federation Law Society does in response to this challenge is they say, okay, we're going to have a model rule that prohibits legal counsel from accepting $7,500 or more in cash. It has to be wire transfer, paper trail, bank transfer, and so forth. To protect against what? Money laundering. Anti-money laundering and fraud. Proceeds of crime. Right? Okay, so that's sort of the concern that's trying to be addressed. So that's what the Federation of Law Society is an example of what they do, right? They respond to issues and they might uh, uh, evolve their rules. So anti-money laundering, there you go. It's called the no cash rule, record keeping requirements. It's a response to an issue. Uh, this is FYI. Some of you from other jurisdictions may be familiar with this. Self-regulation in different contexts and different jurisdictions are listed there. Uh, the law society, sorry, the AG versus Federation of Law Societies case is at page 267 of your text. You can read it in all of its glory. And internationally, fine. Self-regulation, the argument's in favor. It's more efficient, it's cost-effective, who knows better than lawyers, expertise, all good reasons for it. Uh, arguments against, conflict of interest, because, hey, we're lawyers, we might want to watch out for each other. Public versus the profession is the body that regulates lawyers interested in protecting the public, or more its own, like its own. Brethren, sistren, um, and you know, as we see more and more cases from the law society, sometimes some people have argued the penalties are kind of light, they're kind of low, they're kind of not particularly harsh. Um, and so it's an ongoing debate, right? How do we deal with it? If we don't have uh, self-regulation, some say separate it out, some say. Quebec has a special, anyone here from Quebec? You have a special, what's that layer called? There's a special layer of administrative tribunal. Like professions, or you can give them that access to them. Um, that's a good thing. Um, office of the profession, so it's like another layer. So just ways to uh, approach this. Quebec's rules are a little bit. Okay, policy concerns. So these are policy arguments for and against self-regulation. And you know, you can debate it, you can discuss it, you can think about it. It doesn't change the fact that you're um, you have to talk with your provincial your provincial rules. Um, 
And these are some of the arguments. So discipline. Discipline is one of those important aspects because, because there have to be consequences for not complying with the rules that you are obliged to comply with. Page 116. What does page 116 of your text tell us? Probably something interesting. Page 116. All right. And so one of the concepts of um, discipline or one of the underlying issues um, of discipline is, well, first of all, sorry, let me back up. Main reasons for discipline, right? The main kinds of cases that go to hearings that lawyers are charged with being offside of the rules. Fraud, good one, right? Theft, forgery, all that criminal stuff. Violation of a fiduciary duty imposed by law, which could include your client, for example. Inability, which has to do with, um, due to mental, physical, or addiction, which has to do with, um, not competence, but uh, capacity. And then, remember the good old, good old failure to respond to the law society. That's one of the top reasons. Because um, if you can't comply with your own regulatory body, you are ungovernable. We do not want you in our club if you don't follow the rules. Uh, here's an example of a fail to cooperate, fail to accommodate case from 2018. This is a um, this is a real world example. It's an article that you can read. What's on 116? Why did I take you there? 116 is professional misconduct. Okay, okay. Um, okay. This, you know what? I'm not going to go through it. Just in the interest of time, this is FYI. This is an example of an employment lawyer who allegedly breached the rules, but the Law Society found that um, the uh, employer did not accommodate his disability. So it's an accommodation case. You can't cooperate, you should not be accommodated. He needed more time. He was stressed out because of a condition. They so couldn't respond to the request. So it's like it's it's not, it's it's um, new. It's, uh, so in this case, the fail to cooperate was not a problem. Whereas normally it's a very serious thing, right? Okay, so let's talk about professional misconduct. Let me just see. Now let's go to page 116. There you go. What's professional misconduct? What is professional misconduct? What does that term suggest to anyone? Let's start. Let's start with this. Let's start with this. Uh, it's not a hard definition, but it is intended to serve as guidance and commentary for this notion, the CBA Code of Conduct. The CBA, Canadian Bar Association, volunteer organization, you can join if you want, you don't have to, they have their own rules, you can comply with them. The Law Society does have a rule, and they say, the federal, this one does not, so there's no definition in our model code, okay, but Ontario does. And the notion of misconduct in the Ontario Code is professional misconduct needs defined term. Professional uh, conduct in a lawyer's professional capacity that tends to bring to bring discredit upon the legal profession. <coughs> Remember, your conduct, if it's professional misconduct, reflects on all of us. Right? So it brings discredit upon the whole profession. For example, violating or attempting to violate the rules. Knowing or assist, knowingly assisting or inducing someone else to violate the rules. Those are some examples. Um, for example, um, okay, so let's stop here. Let's go to page 116 and let's talk about professional misconduct. Page 116. Reader, here's your chance at golden opportunity. Um, not yet. Oh, sorry, not yet. Yeah, um, page 116, traditionally. Nice and loud. Traditionally, professional misconduct has been defined in terms of disgraceful or dishonorable conduct. Some element, element of moral turpitude was required by negligence by itself would not suffice. While in theory the scope of professional discipline is broad, in practice it is much narrower. One leading commentator has suggested that there are basically four reasons for taking disciplinary action against lawyers. Essentially, lawyers in Canada are subject to serious discipline for just four reasons. Because they have been found, oh, because they have been guilty of theft, fraud, forgery, or some other criminal offense, because they have violated a fiduciary duty imposed on them by law, 
because they are unable to carry on their practices due to physical or mental disability or serious addiction, or because they have failed to respond to inquiries from their governing body. Do you want me to keep um, you're fine. Okay. So professional misconduct, it has to do with, so what, so what do you take from that? What do you take from that? Um, that it's professional misconduct normally happens when you are kind of disgracing the profession by one of, well, what this commentator is that perhaps for means either by doing something illegal, um, by not keeping confidentiality or trust with your clients, so breaching fiduciary duty. Okay. So, yeah. So, like, you are... You are bringing dis just uh, lowering the respect for the rest of us because someone's going to say, look at that lawyer, not respecting their client's confidentiality. All lawyers are bad and they're all liars and they're all, you know. So, so professional misconduct is considered to be conduct that brings discredit in your, compa in your professional capacity while you're working. You've got your lawyer hat on, right? So you are working in your professional capacity. You're bringing disrepute or disrespect to the rest of us by setting that example. Okay, so let's, in a minute, we're going to contrast that. So one example of some of the responsibilities you have are courtesy, courtesy civility, acting in good faith. Let's talk about good faith, right? Good faith with all persons. And remember, each of our model code sections almost all, I think all, have commentary. And this commentary, for example, 5.1-58, says that legal contempt of court and the professional obligation are not identical, are not identical and consistent pattern of rude, provocative, disruptive conduct, even though unpunished as contempt, may still be professional conduct, which means what? Which means Petra. Um, so even if you're not um, punished in court, Still be, um, you can still be punished. They are the losses side. Side. Yeah, exactly. So not enough to say, oh, uh, I was okay. The court did. The court did not find me contempt. Uh, what are your other duties that um, reflect on your professional when you're offside professional misconduct? Well, 7.1-3 says you have a duty duty to report misconduct. Think long and hard. Think long and hard. Talk to your friends, your partners, your mother, your brother, your your uh, classmates. Think long and hard before you report one of your colleagues. It's very serious consequences. It's not a frivolous, it's not a quick decision, it's something very serious that will have con consequences for them and for you and heaven forbid we pull the trigger too quickly. But that said, long and hard, however, if you are aware and you are satisfied that these things are going on, then you absolutely have a duty. You actually are compelled by your own ethical rules to report. Can I see a hand? To report misappropriation. Okay? Be sure, but then you have a duty. Abandonment of law practice. Right? Um, criminal activity. Okay? Mental instability. How, you know, how can you be sure? Uh, questions about honesty, any situations where clients are likely to be materially prejudiced. So again, not hard definitions, nice loosey-goosey, they can be many things, but then your duty is triggered. Case study. Okay, Joe Roy. So, uh, Hands up, yes. Okay. Hands up, no. Okay. Hands up, it depends on what. What did she say? What did she say? Louder. It wasn't good faith that you actually would be. Oh, sorry, you didn't hear the question in the first place. Yeah, I didn't hear If you, if, louder. Sorry. Um, what I asked was, if you were to report somebody and they weren't found guilty of whatever you reported before, can you be penalized? Well, that's why I asked you to vote. And the answer is, it depends. Yeah. It depends. It depends. Yeah, it depends. Was it done in good faith? Did you have reasonable uh, reasons to think that? Did, are you, you know, are you next door and the guy hasn't shown up for six months? It, 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 you know, it depends on that context. So which is why you think long and hard, right? But if you have a good faith concern, 
addiction, mental health, whatever, whatever, then your duty is triggered. So you gotta balance this, right? Are you sure? Has my duty been triggered? What should I do? Am I acting in good faith? Or is it for revenge? Good luck, yeah, if it's for revenge and that is found to be the case. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can be disciplined, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone else? It could also be that's right. It could also mean that uh, the person who's reporting it has some reasonable belief that uh, the lawyer is acting in a non honorable manner. I mean, there could be some instances, nothing too serious, but it could be just a little you know, misappropriating funds here. A little misappropriating. It's like being a little pregnant. Right? Yeah, no, just Either a little. You're in or you're out. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be too serious, but he believes that, yes, if he's doing it at a smaller level, it could one day sure. be Sure, and we know misappropriation is one of the yes. triggers. Yeah. Um, hands up. You think your thing is being, your duty is being triggered, but you don't report it. Hands up. Yeah, you're in trouble. Couldn't hear her. No, oh, louder, louder, louder. Is that louder? <laughs> <laughs> Say a person believes there's something wrong, but chooses not to report. Right? Chooses not to report. Okay, hands up. Yeah, you're in trouble for not uh, complying with your duty. Hands up. No, you've made a decision based on your... It depends. Hands up, it depends. It depends. So it depends, right? It, but like, like, what are your reasons? Maybe you have reasons. If you can satisfy a law society investigating that you have good reasons for not doing so, maybe you're okay. But if you just sit back and say, yeah, she's drunk at her desk every day and passes out, but I'm not really sure she has an addiction problem, maybe you won't, right? So it's gray. It's gray. Little misappropriation. A million bucks. A big misappropriation. Okay, so case study, Joe Broya, question of when zealous courtroom advocacy crosses the line to professional misconduct, right? And remember that notion of he's wearing his lawyer hat. And this is the Briex case. And do you want to give us a thumbnail? Thumbnail only. Well, he Briex. Briex um, was a mining case, and I don't remember many of the details, but a lot of people lost money. Um, Groya was zealously advocating for his client to the point that people thought he crossed the line into being rude and very uh, uncivil. Yeah. And okay, so the, right. so the law society takes action against him, but not the OSC prosecutor, interesting, um, who is, as we speak today, in my world, in court with one of my colleagues, um, or in our tribunal. So, uh, yeah, so Briex is before the OSC. Briex is a mining company. They're salting, so they're fraudulently indicating uh, gold um, holdings. Broya's, um, Broya's proceeding is self initiated by the Law Society. I don't have a client complaint. I had it. It's self initiated. Pick up. Yeah, I, I'm curious about that because to me that just reeks of being targeted. Yeah, so I mean, there was a ton. This is, this is 17 years ago. I think it just was resolved last year, year before. So there was a lot of media coverage. There was a lot of professional debate, there was a lot going on. The Law Society, the Law Society starts it, um, and there's like, the, the, the story's all very, um, it's all very, uh, you know, reality world interesting. There's a guy that falls out of a helicopter, and we don't know if he choked, or was pushed, was it an accident, so it's all very salacious. Okay. Law Society proceeds against Joe Gray, hold on. Um, and, they, at first level, they find him responsible for professional misconduct, right? And costs of $247,000, one month suspension, he appeals. So there's a whole, there's a whole history here. And so Joe Wright is trying to practice law meanwhile, mm -hmm. right? This is one case. By the way, he wins the case at the OSC. Like, he's successful, right? Yeah. Did, you, did you read about it, or what do you know about Joe Breyer and Briex? Or Felder Hoff. Right yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's like, actually, he, he won that case. But look what happens from 2001 mm -hmm. to 2018, right? We have all these different decisions. He's trying to practice law. This is one case. He's got lots of clients. And he's dealing with all of this. And guess what? 2018, a year ago, Supreme Court of Canada, in his favor. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Is it very common or is it more towards being rare for the law society to self-initiate? Very rare. Very rare. Very rare. Very rare. It's a highly unusual case. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. 
So now let's compare professional misconduct, right? Uh, what? Is he a venture? Oh. He is a venture. <laughs> he was elected venture. It's delicious. Yeah. Yeah, he's elected venture. Um, let's compare professional misconduct with conduct unbecoming. And what does conduct unbecoming? Now again, remember, there's no hard definition in the law code for which you're responsible, but the Law Society of Ontario does have um, a definition. And that definition is conduct unbecoming uh, means conduct including a lawyer's personal or private capacity that tends to bring discredit upon the legal profession, including criminal act, improper advantage of youth, violating dishonesty. So it's got that same kind of flavor, but now, guess what? You're not wearing your lawyer hat, but you still have this kind of obligation, right? Because conduct unbecoming can be in your personal and private capacity. So you're coaching your little daughter's softball league, and you yell at the ump, and you tell him, tell her she's blind and stupid, and you make a scene, and your poor kid's going, Duh, shut up. Possible that you might have violated this rule for this concept, for this notion of conduct unbecoming. You're not wearing your hat. You're not in court. You're not disrespecting a judge or the process or your colleague, the lawyer. You're in your personal private capacity. So guess what? You don't get a free pass just because you clocked out and your day is done. Boom, I did my 14-hour day in the office. I'm free now. Uh, no, you still might have an issue with conduct on the public. Um, and guess what? We have a case with a test. We like tests. We like tests that the ju that the case law gives us, because then we have something. We take our facts. We take our text. Their test. We put the two together. We have some kind of guidance. So here's the test for those two concepts. Larakur is a Law Society of BC, does it matter, right? It's a professional, it's the Law Society of another province, no problem, 2011. Here's the test for professional misconduct. Here's how the Law Society will decide. It's guidance, there's this not a one, right? Where the facts disclose a marked departure from the conduct the Law Society expects of members. Well, what the heck does that mean? It means what the Law Society determines it means. When you have case law and you have precedent, so you can read it get a sense of what's, what's a marked departure. And for conduct unbecoming, contrary to the best interests of the public or legal profession or harmful to the standing of the legal profession. So we're always concerned about how does our conduct reflect on everybody else in our profession, whether you're at the baseball field or you're in court saying this judge is stupid, this decision is stupid. Don't do it. So we have a nice case, 2011, not that, you know, not that old, and um, with a nice test that when you're given a set of facts, you say, hmm, is this professional misconduct? Is it conduct not becoming? Let me apply the test. A useful working uh, distinction between those two concepts, course of practice and private life. So where do those things, like where's the hard line? I don't know, but you can think of lots of examples of what you're doing in your private life. And in this case, you know, factually, the lawyer sent a letter to another lawyer because, but it was found not to be conduct unbecoming because it wasn't in a personal capacity, but he also writes a blog and writes a letter to the lawyer saying, you are stupid, you know, and that's professional misconduct, the letter is on letterhead and so forth. So the, the, the Law Society ABC says, well, when we apply our tests, um, you're kind of writing in your professional capacity, and that reflects poorly on us when we call your colleague stupid, or whatever the language is. Um, then you have this other notion, this sort of third notion of extra professional misconduct. Activities outside the role of a lawyer is conduct unbecoming, but in this case, in 2009, this lawyer is having sexual relations with clients, substantial breach of trust, and his license was revoked. Let me see what I have here. What was that? That was but, right? Roya, Roya, Roya. Oh, Lara Kerr, your page reference is 445, like around there. Okay, well, let's go to page 771. Let's see what this notion of 
extra professional misconduct is. Reader, reader, reader. Reader, reader. If you haven't read or given me your thoughts today, 771. Uh, Nichols, 771, and it is um, in our view to the end of drunk. So in our view, go nice and loud setup. In our view, an application for reinstatement is much different from an application for admission to the bar. The applicant in this case, in addition to committing the most serious of crimes, has broken faith with, with his oath, his role as an officer of the court, and as a member of our law society. As Deborah Rode wrote in her article, Moral Character as a Professional Credential, clearly the rationale for monitoring practitioners' personal behavior is somewhat stronger than the justification for screening candidates' conduct. Attorney actions, unlike much applicant misconduct, cannot be discounted as remote in time or the product of youthful indiscretion. Moreover, violations of the law assume a different symbolic dimension when committed by those sworn to uphold it. Ultimately, the bench must assess the effect of the admission to the bar of this applicant on public respect for the legal profession and the law in Alberta. Mr. Sychuk was convicted of a brutal crime, one of the most serious crimes one can commit, who is not a product of youthful indiscretion. Two years prior to killing his wife, he discharged a shotgun in his own home in the presence of his wife and children while drunk. Okay, thank you very much. And that's the side chuck case. So here it is. Second degree murder. And the side chuck is at page, well, it's just, it's 771. It just starts a little bit earlier on. Um, so the concern was the reinstatement would compromise the public's respect for the law and the legal profession, that notion of everyone standing behind you. And he is not reinstated. And so this notion of extra professional misconduct is page 764. One more reader. Page uh, 764, that section that says, at its broadest, at the bottom, 764, uh, subsection D is called extra professional misconduct, and the paragraph starts at, yeah, nice and loud. Uh, at its broadest, so the last paragraph. At its broadest, however, how often law societies to nominate for extra professional misconduct extends much further. It allows the law societies to discipline a lawyer for any behaviors which the law society believes constitute conduct of becoming a member of the law society. Canadian lawyers have been disciplined, albeit in some cases mildly, for conduct of becoming as valid as public nudity, failing to care for animals at the law lawyer's farm, and Writing about chat to a landlord. Okay. So, what do you take from that? What guidance do we take from that? Um, so, don't walk mute in the street. <laughs> okay. Good. What else do we take? Um, so, extra I, I agree. It's sort of it's sort of an extension, isn't it, of conduct and becoming? Uh, Jim Remo uh, and Jim. Yeah. Um, so I just think when you mean professional conduct, it doesn't just mean what you do in workplace. It means professional conduct from the minute you wake up in the morning to the minute you go to bed, right? Like it's almost like you're always being. You're always on. No, like that version. So right. The way you act at work is the same way that you should be acting in your personal life. Because, because you're a lawyer both at work and yeah. when you're not at work, right? And you really but that doesn't change. But I was just going to say that the reach of the law is that it stands Okay, right? And that's, that's what we sign up for. That's exactly right. That's what we sign up for. Okay, let's talk about Hunter. So Hunter is a former bencher, right? It's a four-year term or something, so he's finished his bencher term. And uh, he's a treasurer. Treasurer means like president or CEO. That's what he's meant to put a term. He engaged in self-destructive behavior, sexual relations with a client. He self-reports, eh, and what does the Discipline Society say? Oh, 60 day suspension. So sometimes there are criticisms that the penalties are too low. I'm just saying. Some people say that. Not it. That's Hunter. Oh, Hunter, your page reference is for Hunter is page 
377 early on in 76. And then we have another case of Adams in 2000, which is page 782. And this is exploitation of a 16-year-old. Um, character evidence was good and didn't displace the facts. And the Law Society in Alberta uh, said, we can't, we don't say disbarment is only for the worst cases of murder and such. We can say that it, it can be applied in other cases that that Law Society feels are egregious enough. Uh, page 782, I gave you that reference, right? OK. Competence. So competence, distinct from capacity. Competence is um, an obligation under 3.1-2, under 3 is our big rule with lots of good stuff in it. So competence is um, a requirement that you decline to act if you're not competent in the area. It has to be your area of expertise. Um, the standard is that an error would not have been made by an ordinarily competent lawyer practicing in the same area. It's not perfection. It is relative to your age, your stage, your experience, your area of expertise. And commentary five and six, have I got it up there? Commentary, okay, I'm a little concerned about the time here because it's good. It's better that we have class discussion than we plow through the, the, the slides are just for your assistance or not. Your content is in your book, right? So let's see, three point, no. 3.1-2, 3.1-2, is that it? 3.1, somebody find it quick and offer to read 3.1-2, commentary five and six, here we go. Okay, this is the competency, okay. Um, we need a commentator, can we read or a commentator? Um, anyone who hasn't? Let me do it first. Okay, so commentary five and six. A lawyer should not undertake a matter without honestly feeling competent to handle it or being able to become competent without undue delay, risk, or expense to the client. The lawyer who proceeds on any other basis is not being honest with the client. This is an, uh, this is an ethical consideration and is distinct from the standard of care that a tribunal would invoke for purposes of determining negligence. A lawyer, right. Sorry. Sorry. Continue. Yeah. A lawyer must recognize a task for which the lawyer lacks competence and the disservice that would be done to the client by undertaking that task. If consulted about such a task, the lawyer should decline to act or be obtain the client's instructions to return, consult, or collaborate with the lawyer who is competent for that task. Or uh, our next page, uh, obtain the client's consent. <coughs> Sorry, I just lost it. Okay, that's okay. There's a C part. You're almost done. Obtain the client's consent for the lawyer to become competent without undue delay, risk, or expense to the client. So, you're not competent. You work in family law. You're you're a razor sharp in family law. The problem that someone comes to you and says, you are the most hot, high profile lawyer in our community. I want you. But it's a corporate matter. So, what are your options? You're not competent. So, either you can decline the Sorry, too bad to said. You can say, oh, wait a minute. Let me bring on a senior member of the bar, and I'll be second chair, and I can still be there for name recognition. Happens all the time. Or C, let me become confident. I'm going to read everything, but what? So, you're not. So, what? Lucky you. So, you can become confident, but what are the caveats? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Take turns. Take turn. So, if you want to comment? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. So, try to become um, when you're in the process of trying to become competent, you also have to inform the client yeah. that this is not your area of expertise, so it shouldn't be um, prejudicial or it shouldn't affect the client's case. So you should be upfront and open about the situation. Right, okay, and G? I was going to say it should not be uh, to the detriment of the client. So in becoming competent, you should have sufficient knowledge that you're able to take on whatever task it is. So it must not be at no risk of the client. Right. So you need consent, be forthright, explain, and so on, and say you want to become confident. But by the way, it won't cost you any money, and it won't delay your hearing, assuming you have time, and so on, right? So that is another example of where we have a nice, good rule. And the rule, by the way, if you read just the rule, the rule says 3.1-2. The rule just says 
A lawyer must perform all legal services undertaken on client's behalf to the standard of a competent lawyer. One line, one sentence, good motherhood. It's the commentary that gives you the guts. Do you see what I mean? Like it's like that's the bare bones is the rule, one liner, and then you put the meat on the bones with all this good stuff here, in particular commentary five and commentary six, A, B, and C. And we're almost done today. Um, we'll have no problem catching up today. Next time, we're out of time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh,